As we have been doing, let us just take a few seconds in the Holy Ghost to intercede for the man of God. Let us release our faith. Because the words that we have been receiving this season have been high words. They have been words from the throne. Words to equip us. Words to bring us comfort. Words to deliver wisdom and strategy unto us. And we don't take that lightly. Father, we declare that all glory belong to you. We thank you for the man of God that you have set before us, O oh God. This mighty one upon the watchtower, O oh God, one who sees, one who declares your heart, who declares your mind. Lord, we thank you that you indeed have set this altar, this platform for your word to be ministered yet again. We say again that your glory, all glory, all power, all might belong to you. And we all said amen and amen. Now let us welcome and receive the man of God, Prophet Moses Anderson. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. All righty. Hi, everybody. Let's be seated. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's be seated. God bless you guys. You may be seated also. Um, um, Father, we thank you for yet another opportunity to be here. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, if we want to take that down just a little bit, that would be awesome. Father, we give you praise. We adore you. And I just, I want everybody to pray. I want us all to just take a moment. Let's just take a moment to. We have prayed and we have made supplications. The Bible says, do not worry. Do not be anxious about anything. But in all things, by prayer. I want you to be praying while you listen also. So be praying because things have been said that you need to tap into with utmost concentration. Be anxious for nothing. Do not be perplexed about anything or any situation. But the Bible says that through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. We have prayed, we have made supplications, and now begin to thank God because you know he has heard, he has answered, he has commissioned and dispatched the angels for your sake. Give him thanks in your heart. Okay, we're going to do that all over again because, can we just stop? Hold on for, for a second. Alrighty, let's demote religion very quickly. We're not doing anything religiously this next one or two minutes because even if it's just one person who gets it, it is worth my while, and I believe it is worth the while of the host of heaven. So I want you to listen so that we're not just performing religious obligations or getting into the routine of things when we could be in the spirit of things. So the Holy Spirit told me to stop and do it again because there were people that are not seeing what is before them. If anyone is going to leave the stage before the end of the sermon, maybe you, if you're going to leave before the end of the sermon, I would want you to leave now so that there's no unplugging of anything in the next couple of minutes. But I tell you for a fact that God, when the Bible says that he changes not, that he is as he has always been and that he is the ancient of days. All of that is the truth. He never changes. Our inability to have experiences of the fullness of what it means to have a relationship with God is very much on us 
as individuals. Because God is still the same God that appeared to Moses on Sinai and is still the same God who manifested himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ on the mountain of transfiguration. And so I want you to listen because I was rejoicing in the spirit while the worship was on. And then we transitioned into prayer. And I continued to rejoice greatly within me because I was hearing and I was seeing. And in a moment, it was brought to my attention that there are some of my brothers and sisters, not just the ones watching online, because you know I like to give you all props, but even people present in here today whose eyes are not open to see what the Lord has put before them. The Almighty God comes whenever we come in his name. And he doesn't need 30 people to come in his name. He only needs two or three. And the moment there are two or three in his name, he shows up. But why is it that we go home the same? Sometimes we go home even more heavy, even heavier hearted than we came. Why is it? And that is because we need to be able to see what he has for us in order for our joys to be full. Imagine if Abraham had not been able to see the ram that was caught in the thicket. You see, I know many of us in here have made sacrifices to be with the Lord. I'm not just talking about sacrifices to be here today. You've made sacrifices to follow after God, to chase after him, to seek his face. And Jesus says, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to each one according to his works. It will be such a shame if after all is said and done, we realize that there was more for us than we took. It will be a big, fat shame if we recognize only afterwards that the Lord was with us and we did not know it. And that is the reason why I want to address that issue today because it was just about to repeat itself as we were praying that many are unable to see. And I'm going to help you a little bit because I inquired of the Lord and I asked for it to be broken down to me why folks are not seeing as they should. And he said to me, take for example what happened while worship was on. He said many were fragmented in their thoughts. Your eyes were on situations and circumstances. Your eyes were on religious liturgies. For those people who may not have used that word in the last 40 years, spiritual lit liturgies refer to what you expect to take place within the order of a religious service. And so you're already expecting, okay, they're going to be done singing and we're going to move on to this. Oh, who am I going to say hello to first? And the Bible, Jesus himself speaking, he says, let your eye be single and then your entire body will be full of light. And so there was all the glorious things going on in this place. My wife even reminded us that we have come to the company of innumerable angels. And so we have the host of heaven with us. We have the presence of God. And yet we are not tapping into it as we should. So we will do that Thanksgiving again. And this time around, I want you to attempt to see the one that you are thanking. God wants to be seen. He says, seek me and you will find me. He wants to be seen because he knows that there are certain miracles and transformations that will never take place in the life of a human, of a man or a woman without beholding the glory of God. After having won many battles and taken many trophies and acquired much gold and servants, 
David recognized that beyond conquest is yet a blessing. And that blessing is the blessing of transfiguration. What it means to be transfigured means to have a restoration of the original light of glory that was upon Adam when God made him such that he needed no clothing on his back. The glory of God encapsulated him as a cloud and that kind of radiance is still available to man today. And the Lord is saying, if they do not see me, certain things cannot be complete. And that was why David said, we beheld him and became radiant. And our faces were not put to shame. We need to learn how to be able to zone in when it comes to the presence of God and zero in on the manifest presence of God. Because... One once said, the Lord was here and I knew it not. May that not be the last testimony that is on our lips when the Lord Jesus appears in the blue skies. Let it not be the last thing that we say that, oh my goodness, the entire time he was here. Let it be that you see him and you lay hold of him and say, you are not leaving until I have downloaded all of what you came with in my name. If we're going to get to where we're going to, this is the only way. The only way is to be fully equipped. The only way is to receive the fullness of him who so loves us and always remains eager to give to us all of what we need to fulfill destiny. So when I say, and I'm going back there now, that we have prayed. Actually, the Lord said to me, start from the beginning. And this is the second time I'm hearing it. When the Lord said to me, as you say it, I will do it. And what he wants me to say over you, which I said earlier on, but many were missing it. Let me describe to you. I'm not going to point to anybody, but somewhere in this area, the Lord was holding a blessing that looks like a red metal. And that metal is supposed to go into a bottle, and that bottle represents your heart. But then you kept wobbling. And as you were wobbling, the metal could not go in. And the Lord said to me, to break it down even more, because I know what I saw, that metal represents the power of God. It looks like a spanner. You know, you know like a spanner? Or what is it called here? It's, it's called a spanner, right? It looks like a, like a tool that, uh, that is used for changing tires. It's called a wheel spanner. And what does that do in the life of a man, it gives him leverage. It magnifies your little power. And God is saying, I am bringing leverage into your life, but you are unable to receive it. The bottle keeps wobbling. Thank you, Lord. As I was saying that, I said, Lord, what if they ask me, why was the bottle wobbling? And he said to me, tell them it's because it's been empty for too long. The bottle's been empty for too long, and that is the reason why it's blown about by the winds, and that's why the leverage of God is unable to come into your life. God wants to bring you leverage so your five-minute prayer can be like a five-day prayer and fasting. He wants to bring leverage into your life so that the little love you are able to show will return to you in a flood of compassion. But that bottle needs to be filled and it needs to be steady. You already know who you are because I once told you that you are like Peter. And you know, God said, Jesus said to Simon, he says, Simon, Satan wants to sift you as wind. He wants to blow you about. He wants you to be unstable. And so you need to stop being Simon and be Petros. You need to be steady, weighty, 
in the Lord as that rock so that you can have that enablement of God come right into you. Repent from dead works this very moment. I say to you in the mighty name of Jesus, repent and let your heart steady before the Lord that you may receive God's divine enablement. Now for the rest of us and for you also inclusive, the Lord said to me to say, be anxious for nothing. You may have heard that as an advice. You may have received it as a commendation. Like I commend you to the grace of God that you may be anxious for nothing. But I come to you today in the spirit of righteousness and by God's favor. And I say to you today to receive that word as help from God. Receive the word, be anxious for nothing as a divine intervention from God to stop your heart from palpitating and fretting in the face of things that you cannot overcome. At least not on your own. And that is the reason why the Lord wanted to get your attention first of all because he says, I need them to see their help. David knew that he needed to see his help. That was why he said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. He didn't say I will lift up my hands. I'm not just about to handshake with my help. I'm not about to just let my help pick me up. There is a particular kind of help that you need to see. And that is the reason why the Lord is saying, I need your full attention so that you can see that I have come for you and see the help that I have sent. The Lord has, has heard our prayers. He has received our supplication. He says, but as they thank me, I want them to see me. So I want you once again, and this time around properly, let us be as focused as we can be. Whatever that looks like for you, if it takes closing your eyes, to focus, focus, and behold the lamb that is caught in the thicket. See the Lamb of God. Let your, the eye of your heart go to work and see the Lord. In the beauty of his holiness, see the Lord. In the splendor of his joy, see the Lord and see providence. See the Lord and see power. See the Lord and see grace, see the Lord. And when you see him in the eye of your imagination, say thank you. You're not thanking another one. You're thanking the Lord of hosts. You're thanking the lover of your soul and the captain of your salvation. You're thanking the one who laid down his life so that you would not be taken away because of saying, the one who said, I am yours and you are mine. The one who calls himself your portion in the land of the living. See the man of Calvary. See the man of Galilee. See the one who goes about doing good. See the healer of the sick and the raiser of the dead. See him and in whatever capacity you can imagine him this moment, he will begin to deliver in your life. See him. As far as your eyes can see. Everything that you can see is yours today. See him holding you in his embrace. See him stroking your hair. See him lifting you to heights that you've never been able to reach. As much of him as you can see today, you can have. See him as the provider. See him as the controller of the gates and the windows of heaven. See him as the one who has promised to open the windows to pour you a blessing. See him as the baptizer with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Whatever you need to see him at today, see him and you can have what you see. See the glory and the lifter of your head. 
See the one that comes alongside to help you. You have been speaking to situations that have not budged. You have been speaking to children that are not responding. See the Lord standing with you today to speak with his voice that cannot be denied. Even though the voice of the blood of Abel cried from the ground, it was not enough to deal with the sin of Cain. But the Lord came and he said, I have heard the voice of Abel, your brother crying to me from the ground for his blood seeks vengeance. And the Lord says, I have now come to speak. And the Lord spoke on the behalf of Abel. See the one who advocates for you. See the mediator today. See the one who is your advocate. See him speak on your behalf. See him operate on hearts in your stead. Those people whose hearts have hardened against you, see the Lord touch their hearts and soften their hearts. See Jesus make a way where there is no way. See transformation today. The Lord says to you today, I believe this is a blank check. He says to you today, whatever you see of me, that I will do. I want to see you, Lord, today. You need to see him as the high priest that bears the blood of purification. You need to see him as the one who cleanses from unrighteousness. You need to see him as the one that rescues from death. Some of you, you need to see the Lord cutting the rope that hangs your neck. You need to see the Lord cutting you loose from the oppression of Satan. You need to see the Lord taking payment and settling your debt and saying to your creditors, I have paid all of you in his name. He is free to go. What can you see? The Bible says that when Jesus spoke a word, demons left the room. And you know what demons have troubled you. You know what things you have struggled with. See Jesus as he comes through to drive out the evil ones from your life. See Jesus, speak that word. Be free, speak that word. Go! And all that which troubles you will go. And also see him say, come. And the virtues that I've been missing will begin to come from within you. By the power of the Holy Ghost, today is the day of deliverance. As much as you can see of him, you can have. I called on the Lord and he heard me from his holy hills. I stood in the gap and I said, Lord, take my life as that of an intercessor. Set me up and let my destiny be that of a watchman that no one that you have sent to me will be robbed of the enemy of grace. And the Lord heard me. And he came through and stood by me today to speak deliverance into the lives of many. And so today seize the opportunity and grab your deliverance. Grab your prosperity and say concerning yourself, I am one that the Lord Jesus has set free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Lay hold of mercy today and be free. Father, we kill you, Mushilia. Amukum Adele Tums. Hayele Kurus Tilaf Adiamandi. As Yukwala Freya Laminda. You need to see him as the porter 
of the oil. You need to see yourself standing before his grace and having the oil of the anointing poured upon your life, the same anointing that breaks the chains. See your shackles broken. In whatever areas Satan and the opposition has tied your hand, today see freedom, see liberty. In the mighty name of Jesus, Makororoshi apamusu yeladi yeladi ma pamusu yeladi oro ainmo siya ain ma madumai yema homo musiya ang ma mudushiya hariyoskuya hariyamasi hariya. Hariyam Sula Hariyam Masi Mama Rokodushti Allah Brodus Ketelia Brodushti Allah Brodotos Kerementa Tatari Sriatatomus Krodododo de Geda Ramanda Brata Ramon Tamtormus Shila Kadabasa Hale I see my light has come. I see the glory of the Lord is risen upon me. And I see myself rise and I see the shining. I see the clock touched by the hand of God. The last touch on the clock was the hand of my heavenly father. And even the clock spoke to me and said that my time has come. You are beautiful beyond description and to marvelous for words. You are too wonderful for comprehension like nothing ever seen on earth. Who can grasp? Your infinite wisdom and who can fathom the depths of your love. You are beautiful beyond description, majesty and throne above. Lord, I stand. I stand in awe of you, holy God, to whom all my praise is due. I stand in awe of you. I had to sing that song because the Lord said to me, that a scribe that is instructed in the things of God will bring from his treasures things that are both old and new. Every blessing that you receive of the Lord today comes with depth. And when I say your blessing comes with depth, it means that it is not just a surface blessing that will appear as though you have only just been helped. It will seem like you have had help a long time because it is both old and new. Why don't you just praise him? Hallelujah. Give him praise. Hallelujah. I'm just going to ask very quickly, if you felt light or if you feel light-bodied as you're getting up, or you just feel light-bodied, light-bodied, can I see your hand up? Praise the Lord. Everyone whose hand is up would say this, 
but it is for one person in, in particular. But I want you all to say it. Say that all that has left me today that was uprooted by my father don't come back. In the mighty name of Jesus, don't come back. Because the Bible says that after Jesus delivered the boy, the Bible says the evil spirit convulsed him and the boy fell to the ground as though he was dead. However, as soon as he got up, as a testament or proof of his deliverance, we knew that the spirit had left him, but Jesus saw that the spirit was looking back. And the Bible says, Jesus said, do not return. I'm thankful for everybody who bore witness today, but I want to say to you, the Lord says, do not reveal who it is, but say to her anyway. I say to you that I have come to you in the voice of the resurrection and the life. And I say to the spirits that have troubled you that have not been driven out by your heavenly father in the name of his only begotten son, I say to them, do not return. I decree over you today, do not return. And it is an eternal order, do not return. Father, we give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed art be your name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name, Lord of majesty, divine authority, hallowed be your name. I give you thanks, Father, because we have come to a season I will tell you, but the Lord says to declare it first and then welcome you into it. We have come to the season of redemption. And in particular, vindication. Every laughter that you released because you received a word from God will now be an eternal laughter because you will receive the promise. <laughs> Hallelujah. These blessings will outlast you. So let me explain to you what I just said. Remember the story of Sarah the wife of Abraham. When the Lord visited Abraham and the Lord was having a conversation with his servant and friend, he said to Abraham, it's done. We just came to give you confirmation that a year from now, your wife will be with child. Sarah, as it was their custom, had to be in the other room because she wasn't particularly allowed where the men were, which I've told you before, was God's plan to bless women with the prophetic so that they learn how to hear even when they don't see. That is the reason why we need women to provide guidance in this darkness that we're in. So Sarah was in the other room. Even though she didn't see what was going on, she heard. And the Bible says she laughed. And the Lord was like, well, you can laugh all you want. I have said what I have said, and it will happen. And a year from that moment, 
she held a baby in her arms that was not someone else's child, that was not there for a play date, that was not born by a maidservant. She held her own baby. I say that because some of us, we have been running with other people's blessings. Borrowed funds, borrowed identities, shared opportunities. There ain't nothing wrong with that, but they've fulfilled their purposes in the seasons before now in the seasons past. And now it's a new season wherein you will have your own child, your own blessing. You know, sometimes when you're homeless and someone lets you come and stay in one room or even to come and crash on their couch, that is some kind of blessing. But the Lord is saying, this, is, this one is going to be in your name. This one is going to be yours. You will hold this baby in your hand. You know, it's a privilege sometimes to enjoy other people's graces. You know, some of us know we have been able to buy certain things because somebody else stood in for us as a guarantor. But the Lord is saying, I am your guarantor. Going forward, you will hold your own blessing. And when Sarah held Isaac, she couldn't think of any other name than to call him Isaac, which means to laugh. Isaac means laughter. So every one of us who laughed when we received the promise, when the Lord sent his anointed one and his prophet to say to you, brother, brother Bradley, you're about to begin to see angels and you rejoiced and you laughed and now it's been a while and you're saying, when will these things be? The Lord says that we have come to the season of redemption, of vindication and you will hold your laughter in your hand. Because the Lord himself sees how you received his word with gladness. He knew that you received the prophetic declaration of your healing with gladness. And he says it might have taken a while, but you are about to receive that healing for real. I came in here today and I could hear it clear as day. It was like God gave me an insight into the meeting before the meeting. It's not like he said I did. He gave me an insight. And I saw the Lord say, tell them not to be discouraged because we are on the way. Hallelujah. You know, when God says we, are on the way. That's all you need to hear. Because whenever God moves, and he doesn't just move by himself, but moves with the Elohim, he moves. You see, God is not just moving this time around with the scepter, but he's moving with the throne and the crown. And so every angelic being, be it cherub or seraphim, that has an assignment to protect the assets of God's glory will have to leave heaven and go wherever God goes. Because there's no point remaining in heaven when the throne itself is on the move. And so when the Lord says we are coming, he is coming with a myriad of his saints. And they're coming for your redemption. They're coming for your reward. You know, we may not look like who we are before our Heavenly Father. You know, many may have ridiculed us because they ridicule us because we keep professing that we believe. And they're like, maybe you need to try something else. No, we don't. We will wait until we see Him. And now He says that He's on the way. Be patient. Be patient. Clap unto the Lord and give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is good. I'm just going to read one more scripture to us. Um, and then we will, we will wrap it up nicely. Let's go to the book of Nahum. 
the book of Nahum. Nahum, Nahum, just go there. And we're going to read. <laughs> Hallelujah. Rabokunde Yalamande Sutoria. We're going to read uh, 1 7. I believe we read it recently. Uh, the book of Nahum is after the book of Micah. Alrighty. God is good. 1 verse 7. This is what it says in the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7. Now, Cody, please, I see you already about to give out the communion. Please go ahead. Your timing is impeccable, as always. God bless you. And everybody, it's Cody's birthday today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Cody. Happy birthday to you. Praise the Lord. God is good. You know, the Bible says, and it was Alan who was reading to us uh, David's prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus. I believe it's Psalms 101, is it? 110, Psalms 110. He was reading it to us earlier when David was given the opportunity to see what happened the day Jesus was raised from the dead. And David lived, what, like maybe 980 years or so before the Lord Jesus. He saw... What happened the day Jesus was raised from the dead? Because remember when Jesus was raised from the dead, praise God, thank you, Cody. The, the, remember the day Jesus was raised from the dead, Mary, one of the Marys, saw Jesus and wanted to touch him. She wanted to give him a hug, like, dude, you, you're back. And Jesus was like, ah, no, not yet. I, I, I'm out, but I'm not back. Huh. I think... When I said that, I saw pure joy. And so I'm going to say this to you. Some of us are, are, are out, but we're not back. You've come out of the grave, but you're not back yet. You see what I mean? But it's a thing of joy. At least you're out, and you will be back. You see? Because I wasn't intending to say it that way, but that was what I saw. Jesus said to her, I am out, but I am not back. In these words, do not touch me because I have yet to go to the Father. And so that was the day that he was raised from the dead. Before other people saw him, he said to the lady, don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm out, but I need to first of all go up. To my father, and then I can come back to y'all. And the significance of that is this. Jesus said that. And on the day that he was raised from the dead, he said that. But David had seen it about a thousand years prior. And you know what he said? He said, and the Lord. So he didn't see it from the perspective of the woman. He saw it from the perspective of one of the uh, four living creatures. You know, those ones that have eyes all around them. They, they see everything. And so sometimes you can borrow one of their eyelids to see the things that have been decided concerning you. Okay? And that's why sometimes it's good to pray and to pray until you are translated. You understand what I mean? It doesn't have to be 24 hours. It doesn't have to be... Two hours, it doesn't have to be, it just has to be until you know that a translation has happened. That you have prayed to the point where you have left the room where you're at and you've gone somewhere else. You understand what I mean? You see, because I was saying it, I've been saying it since yesterday and I don't know why, but I know why now. That I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so some of us have not been able to say that we are glad. Our joys have not been full because we are still praying in our closets. We haven't gone to the house of the Lord. I'm not just talking about coming to church and being in a building and in a gathering of this sort, which is phenomenal. I mean, the spirit and the presence of God that is in here is amazing. But if you want your joy to be full, Pray yourself out of your closet, out of your car. Pray yourself into his presence. Keep praying until you know that 
Yes, you have shifted. Let me give you an example of one of the ways by which you know that you have left where you're at. You see, there are certain times where if you sit down and just think about all of what you're going through, you become sad, depressed, and weighed down. Right? Because in this world, we have tribulations and trials, and we don't have to pretend we do. Jesus promised us, he says, in the world, in this world, you will have tribulations and trials. And sometimes if I remain in that place, that is all I feel. I feel the weight of the things that I'm going through because they are real situations. So what do I do? I pray until I am translated to a place of light bodiness, a place of joy, a place of light heartedness, a place wherein those problems cannot get to because they are of the darkness and now I am in the light. Don't just pray and get up while you're still feeling the same. You have just exercised. But if you truly want to prevail, you need to learn how to pray until you begin to feel the things that are described of in heaven. In heaven, there is righteousness, peace, and joy. So if you're not feeling the joy, if you're not yet at peace, then what are you hurrying to go and settle? Because some of us, we time the presence that we, I mean, we, we, we time our presence in his presence. Whereas the Bible says, do not hurry out of the presence of the king. Why stand in an evil place? So that means anywhere that God is not is an evil place. And so that is the reason why you need to make sure that you're not in a hurry. You stay there until the things of heaven start to become real to you. At least begin with the joy. Because in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And then after a while, you get to the point wherein you begin to tap into other things that are described in the presence of God. You see, and one of those things described in the presence of God is that in the presence of God, there are creatures that have four faces. You've heard about the beings in the presence of God that would have the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. Do you know that if you spend enough time allowing yourself to press into the presence of God, you can assume the form of those beings because if it is in God's presence, it is available to you. And why would somebody want to have four faces? I'll tell you the reason why you want to have four faces. There are certain times wherein many of us are faced with a situation that is supposed to give us multiple victories, but we get only one crown and we leave simply because the facial, the facial recognition for turning in that blessing is not just one face. You need multiple faces to get multiple doors to open. As much as my wife and I look like each other, she cannot unlock my phone. <laughs> Sorry, not my wife, maybe my son. He cannot unlock my phone. You know why? Because of the fact that that phone knows only one face. And many of us, all the face that we have is the face of a man. The face of a man does not cut it all the time. There are times wherein you need to have the face of an eagle. An eagle can see things that you cannot see. You know one of the reasons why I have prayed to see as an eagle sees is this. As a man, there are certain things that I have seen and by the time I get there, it's no longer there. Or sometimes I see things and I want to target them and my hand can slip and I will miss the target. But when you see as an eagle, can I tell you something about the vision of an eagle? The eye of the eagle is connected to every part of the eagle, including the tip of its feathers. So whatever an eagle sees, his entire body can maneuver to attain it. We will teach more on these things, but there are benefits to being in the presence of God. That was what was revealed to me about David. David would always be in the presence of God. He says, one thing do I desire. One thing, I'm not seeking too many things. He says, one thing do I desire and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of God 
all the days of my life. You know why? He says, because there I get to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord. You see, when you are in the presence of God, you are inside of possibilities. So why do you need to seek anything else when you can have that one thing, the master key that opens all things? And so David, he, he desired and he persisted until he became a regular in the presence of God. Because how else do you explain being able to see the day of resurrection? In Psalms 110, he said, And the Lord said to my Lord, Arise and sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. Let us look at Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. And this is what it says. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he who knows, and he knows those who trust in him. I'm going to break that down very quickly, and we're going to break bread with this scripture and another scripture from Isaiah, but we're not going to read that one just yet. Isaiah chapter 29, we're going to look into that very quickly. What have we just read? Brit, the Lord is good. Period. It doesn't have to feel like it sometimes. It doesn't have to look like it. The man of God, Job, I believe, he said, even if the Lord slays me, I will trust in him. Now, I have come to address something in the body of Christ. And because it has been brought to my attention, I believe that it's been brought to my attention for your sake so that you do not get into the bandwagon of those who have upped on the train of pleasure that is leading to destruction. In recent times, I have noticed that there is a voice that is sounding out of many churches and many believers, or let me say many Christians, because believers have four faces, they're more adaptable, and they move when the cloud moves. They can be lions when they need to be lions, eagles when they need to be eagles. But Christians just have the face of the idol in their temple. Let me explain what I just said. Because some of these things are now, have become necessary for us to break them down. When I said a lot of Christians only have the faces of the idols in their temple, is that many religious settings today, the Christians who attend do not even see themselves in relationship with God. They only see the one that they have idolized. So, subconsciously and in the spirit, they are faceless beings. I've even heard of places where people will pray and they will say, oh, the God of these men are God. Please come and help us. Even when Jesus himself was speaking, he says, I'm going to my father and your father. So don't just be thinking he's my father. He's your father too. You understand what I mean? But many people have become faceless because the only face that they identify with in the realm of the spirit and in the face of situations is the face of their quote-unquote man of God. When you can have four faces, why would you want to have none? And be walking around with a borrowed face. You know the significance of a face in the realm of the spirit? The face is what you present for access, and it is also the platform for delivery. The glory of God is not put in your pocket, it is put on your face. And why does God put his glory on your face? Because God wants you to come before him, show your face, let Christ be seen in you, and then receive glory on that face. So when you turn around, everything that you behold will know that a graced one has come. Because the doors that hold the blessings that changes things, the blessings that bring fulfillment to the life of a man, those doors only open for royalty. The Bible says, lift up your head, O ye gates, 
and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. While that instruction was being given, those doors and gates did not move until they told them that it was the king of glory that was coming. Listen to me, it wasn't just the king of kings. Hear me well. It's not just the king of Zion. The Bible says the king of glory. Why was he referred to as the king of glory in that place? It means the one who carries glory in his face. And he says, you are kings and priests unto your God. So if you do not carry a face of glory, the gates will not open because you might be a king, but you are not a king of glory. Jesus said, as I am, so are you. He is the king of kings because you are kings. And if he is the king of glory, you need to be a king also who has a face of glory. And so if things will begin to open up for us, then we need to have that glory. And that is the reason why heaven's blessing delivery system is to the face. Because once you have the right face, you have access to the right places. Let's go to Isaiah 29. Was that what I said, Isaiah 29? Let's go to Isaiah 29. And then we're going to quickly come back to this um, Nahum. Isaiah 29, 17. The Bible says in Isaiah 29, 17, that it is not yet, is it not rather, yet a very little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. The Bible says, how long? Dear, is it not in just a little while? I'm going to come back to this, the news about the body of Christ and what things we need to address. But I had the release to quickly say this to you. The Bible says, is it not in just a little while? What did I tell you when I came up here? I said, the Lord's been saying to me to let you know it's not going to be that much longer. He's redeeming you. Is vindicating you and he is allowing for you to have that which you petitioned of the Lord. Now, why did God specifically talk about Lebanon in, I, in Isaiah 29, 17? You know what Lebanon means? Lebanon means white. And when you see God refer to a land as white, that means its blessings are long overdue. Because when a field is ripe with harvest, it is said to be white. Because all the head of the grains are ready to go. And so the Lord is saying that I know that you are long overdue for blessings. But it is not that much longer before you can bring the fruitfulness. And it will be so much so that it will seem like a forest by the time you are done harvesting. So they look at your life and they don't see what God is doing because your life still looks like a clean piece of paper. It still looks white from their perspective. It looks like a blank slate. And they're like, oh, where is all the promises? Where is all of the petition? But the Lord is saying, don't worry, it may look like Lebanon, but I am telling you, I am making it rain in just a little while. I say to you today, be of good cheer. The Lord is good. Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. He says, the Lord is good. So it is not just what Pastor Moses says. It is what the Bible says. God is good. I used to say that so much at some point. And when it was my birthday, or maybe it was it my birthday, I got multiple cards, and the cards read, God is good. God is good. I'm like, okay. Maybe, maybe I need to start saying something else. But God is good. So here is a pandemic that is now in Christianity. Faceless people. 
who will present the face of the idols. You know, because when men continue to present themselves instead of presenting God, they essentially become idols in the lives of those who receive them. Some of them innocently. But whether innocently or not, you know that you, as we say, ignorance is not an excuse in the court of law. So whether ignorantly or innocently, people have been deceived. And the Lord is saying that this issue, which I'm about to describe briefly in a moment, needs to be, it, it must not be heard amongst us. We must not be one of those people. We must not be one of those people. And you know what the issue is? Is that people now say things like, oh, that can be God. Because if it's God, it's not going to look like that. Hmm. I, I've, I've seen it. It's always been there somewhat. But it has now become a thing thing wherein people associate walking with God with living a life of pleasure. And the reality of it is this, people are ignorant. Why? Because it's been prophesied that in the last days, men will become lovers of themselves more than they are lovers of God, and they will become lovers of pleasure. And so when people go to a place or go through an experience and it's not pleasurable, it cannot be God. But what did Job say? He says, even if the Lord, even if I'm watching him holding a knife to chop off my head, I will still trust him. He says, even if he slays me, I will trust him. But people only want to trust God when they think he is being nice. And that is how Satan will deceive many in the days to come. So I want to encourage you, take the position of Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 that says God is good. Regardless, God is is good. I'm going to show you two more things in Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 and we're going to finally, this time around, break bread. If we don't break bread after this one, just break your own. <laughs> yes, because we, we may need to take it by force. As the days of John the Baptist. Okay, let's go. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7, the Bible says, the Lord is a stronghold. When? In the day of trouble. Why does God need to tell us that he is good? Because he knows that if you do not have a revelation that God is good, when the day of trouble comes, you will run from your post and seek a pleasurable place. And Satan, who does not want you to remain in your place, will make sure that he prepares a bed for you instead of you to stand where the Lord is preparing a table for you. You see, because God does not prepare a table for you in the most convenient place. The Bible says he prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And so when you see opposition coming at you, what you need to do is you need to start to rub your belly because a table is being prepared. Chris looked at me and Chris was like, what belly? I know I got a flat stomach, but I had to, I had to act anyway. Okay, maybe I should have done this in a belly. But I tell you what, the Bible says God is good because that knowledge is your stronghold in the day of trouble. Praise the Lord. And lastly, and this is really where I was going. So if I take two minutes on this one, it's because those other ones were just along the way. Where I was really going is this. The Bible says, and he knows those who trust him. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is good. He knows those who trust him. Now, why is that important to you and I? What did the Bible say that we just read in Isaiah chapter 29 verse 17? The Bible says it is not much longer. And so if it is not much longer... That Jesus is coming with his reward. What is the one thing that I need to guarantee when Jesus returns? There's only one thing that I need to guarantee. That I need to make sure of. I need to make sure of one thing. That Jesus knows me when he comes. Because Jesus told the story to his disciples. 
He took them on a time travel to the day of judgment. And he showed them ministers of the gospel who came, who were miracle workers, but whose heart did not love their brethren. They just did it for the show, for the money, for whatever reason they did it. They did it for themselves. Because you know, the Bible says, as many as believe, to them have we given the power. And these signs will follow them that believe. So some people truly believe that Jesus is the son of God and received the power to pray for the sake, to do all of these things. And yet they did not fully allow their hearts to conform to the image of the son of God. And so Jesus said to his disciples, look at them. They have come to me. He said, but I do not know them. He says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I know you not. And they were like, oh, Jesus, you must be kidding. You must know us. We know you. We did miracles in your name. And Jesus said, now so what? He said, but when I was hungry, what did you do? When I was naked? Exactly. You were busy doing miracles. So off you go. But the ones who came in the humility of heart, who may not have been known by anybody else. They may not have written one book, nor appeared in a single poster. They may not have spoken on radio, nor appeared on television. They may not even be known in the next street. But Jesus says, yours is the kingdom of heaven. He said to them, come, to the, come into the rest of your Lord. And they were like, ah, oh, are you sure? He says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. Jesus knew who they were. The only requirement is to be known by Jesus. And the Bible says this is one way by which the Lord gets to know you personally. Someone says, oh, but he is God. He knows everybody. Oh, yeah. He, even those people working miracles, Jesus knew of them, but he just didn't know them. You understand what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there are so many people, you, you know of so many celebrities. You know of them, but do you know them? And do they know you? You understand what I mean? And so Jesus says, you are not known to me, so go into damnation. But the ones that he knows, when he comes, he will say, Manuel Lida. He will call us by name as an introduction. And then afterwards, he will no longer call you by the name everybody calls you. You know, the Bible says that each and every one of us, we have a name that only God knows. And that name is written upon our foreheads in our new bodies. And other people will not be able to call you by that name. Why is that so? It used to bother me. I used to wonder, I'm like, God, what is, why would you, why would I have a name that my friends cannot call me by? And what is that? And he said to me, they can call you whatever they want. But I have a name because of how much I love you. It is a pet name. And he said to me, how will you feel if somebody comes and calls your wife? Oh, my beloved. I said, oh, that would be the day. <laughs> oh, that would be the day. You understand? Be, you know, because I have all kinds of pet names for my wife. And God was like, that's, that's exactly why that name is a name that I alone will call you. Praise the Lord. And the secret behind that name is what we just read. The people who learn to trust God through difficult times, to trust and who are able to profess that God is good, even when things are not, are the ones that God knows. And your pet name is a name that he forges between the two of you on the basis of what you and God have gone through together. There are conversations that I have with my wife that I can't have with anybody else simply because these conversations were born out of genuine trust when things were tough. And God wants people like that that he can have a pet name for that is grounded and rooted in faithfulness. That even when I didn't seem to be a good God, you didn't leave me. And that is the reason why when you are not a good child, he doesn't leave you. Praise the Lord. And so as we break bread today, we're just going to borrow one more verse of scripture very quickly. You know, because I haven't read from Micah in a while and I miss it. So we're just going to read from Micah. We're going to read Micah. Micah 1, verse 6. 
And so in your heart, be meditating on the ones that we have read because they are part of our breaking bread scripture. Use um, Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 to open the wrap and use Isaiah 27 verse 19 or 29 verse 17 to take the bread and now Micah chapter 1 verse 6, in fact, I think it's 6 verse 1, My, sorry, it's 6 verse 1. The Bible says in Micah 6 verse 1, hear now what the Lord says, arise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Let what the hills hear your voice. I wanted to give that to you as a bonus because when I told you that David would not just say, oh, I'm going to look for help. He says, I will lift up my head to the hills from whence come my help, right? The Lord has positioned help for you on the hills of Zion. And those hills, they have to hear your voice. So you need to pray until the help that is available for you on the hills begin to respond. So as we break bread today, I want you to combine all three of them. I will not relent in trusting and depending on God and looking to him for help and calling to him for help because I know that he is good. And through that process of resilient confidence in God, we get to know each other so that when the reward comes, he will be able to call me by my name to rise to the podium to receive the medal of victory and the crown of glory. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because once again, we have been with you and you have been with us. Our blessings remain and so do our victories. And as we go forth from here, we're going from glory to glory in Christ Jesus. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. And because it's going to take Alan about 12 minutes to get here, or 12 seconds, I'm just going to quickly say to us, be of good cheer. Jesus says, I have overcome. So whatever it is that you're going through today, whatever it is, I know that sometimes you want someone to agree with you in prayer. You want someone to lay hands on you. I want to encourage you. I, I volunteer Manuel Lida and Alan. I volunteer them after the meeting. They're going to be right here to hold hands with you in agreement. You see? But you don't have to get to them here. Someone else might have already been sent to you where you're at. So after service today, let's spend a moment or two and just fellowship with one another and be a blessing to one another. You see, because there is power available in the presence of God to break the yokes and to destroy the burdens. So don't leave here today with a heavy heart. Don't leave here today until you know that your hope is renewed in the goodness of God. And I hope it already is because you have just heard once again that God is good. God bless you. I'll see you on Tuesday. Hallelujah. God is good. What a night tonight. Let's prepare our tithes and offerings, given in faith unto night for what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. To our family online, several ways to give. Cash App, Dollar Sign, Communion House. PayPal, at Communion House, as well as our Zelle. And text to give information there. Excuse me. So much to be thankful for tonight. If you need an offering envelope, it's here to my side. Feel free to just come and grab one and give under the instruction of the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for this time of fellowship, this moment, this hour, that you have called, no God, for visitation. But truly, you have seen about us, for you love us, O oh God. 
and you order our steps. We say unto you that there is none like you. Father, we give you praise for you have made us the righteousness of you, O God. You have kept us all this long while. And Lord, you have declared that in just a little while we shall see, O God. Father, we give you praise for this night of stirring, O God, this night of impartation, a night of encouragement that we shall go back lifted. Father, let these offerings, these times, be found pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling unto you, O God, as we give cheerfully in your name. We declare that all glory belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. What a night tonight. I'm so thankful. We've been in his presence. Let's be intent on taking this home. I want us to have a blessed night tonight. And even as the man of God has declared, if you just like someone to touch and agree with you, myself, Sister Manuel Lita will be over here. Otherwise, have a safe night and we'll see you next week.